I'm Katie Massad, and this is Flute Unscripted, candid conversations with musicians, makers, and masters. I sit down with a new artist every week and share their uncensored stories with you. You're listening to Season 1, brought to you by Flute Center of New York, the exclusive marketplace for flutes. Join us and subscribe. And please stay tuned to the end of the episode for a special Flute Center of New York code for our podcast listeners. Our guest today does it all. Emily Bynan is the principal flutist of the Royal Concertgebouw Orchestra in Amsterdam. She has appeared as a soloist with the Philharmonia Orchestra, BBC Orchestras, Academy of St. Martin in the Fields, amongst others, and has performed with chamber groups such as the Nash Ensemble and the Brodsky Quartet. Ms. Bynan is also a versatile recording artist. Her albums span a wide breadth of repertoire, from her dazzling interpretation of Mozart to her premier recordings by contemporary composers. Emily Bynan grew up in a musical family. She found her father's old flute in a closet, picked it up, started taking lessons, and the rest was history. Ms. Bynan sat down with me to discuss the joys and challenges of her multifaceted career. Can you talk more about your position with the Concerca Bow? When did you start with them? Um, I started um, in 95. So this is my 23rd season. Wow, congratulations. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and I love it as much, if not more, than I did the day I started. It's a wonderfully and constantly enjoyable position. I think mm-hmm. the, the repertoire we do, the conductors and soloists we work with, I love the touring, I love playing different concert halls. Of course, our home concert hall is, is a dream, mm-hmm. and I love living in Amsterdam, so what's not to like? Right, really? yeah. I mean, you know, maybe the stress is not <laughs> something do that you, I enjoy. When you look ahead and you see the, the schedule coming up, do you yeah. kind of have like a mini yeah. palpitation <laughs> moment looking at what's on there? Like if you see, you know, big, what yes. are those for you? For I mean, for me, it's if I see Daphnis or, or Fawn, those would be some yeah, sure. major little heart sure. attack moments. Sure. What are those well, for you? Well, in a way, but those, at least you're, those, you know, I've been practicing those, you know, so long right um so there's always of course there you know you see that coming up in the schedule and you know when it is and and Mm -hmm. you plan your work around that uh that time very carefully of course so Mm -hmm. that you're well enough in shape but not completely exhausted Mm -hmm. and uh, but it would also drive me mad to just stay at home for three weeks before a a concert like that right so it's that's always uh, a juggling act but then there there are things like in a few weeks we've got manfred symphony tchaikovsky which I've only played once in like a conducting class when I was a student. Mm -hmm. So that's a few years ago now. (laughs) And and I remember being so difficult. And I was speaking to a colleague about something we were going to plan in that week. And I said, oh, but that's a week of Manfred. And I think I really need to keep every every spare minute. I've got to really get on top of that. He said, really? It's not so difficult, is it? I said, no, no, I remember from when I was a student, it was so hard. It was the most difficult orchestral part I'd come across that, uh, until that point. And he said, oh, yeah, but, you know, years years on, it must be much simpler. And I, during the Christmas holidays, I took it out, and it's even more difficult than <laughs> I remember. Well, you think so, you'd have a different perspective so, now on that. It yeah, might, but, yeah, you know, yeah. I think the older I get, the more I sort of think, actually, there are, there are things which I did when I was younger, and I think, goodness me, how on earth did I manage to do that? So I think, if anything, things get more difficult, not easier. But, right, um, yeah. yeah. And yeah. and how do you feel about, um, you know, practicing and managing your everyday routines and schedules? I mean, it's it's busy, and, and you're touring all the time and yeah. teaching a lot. Yeah. Um, what is your practice schedule like now versus when you were a student? Oh, gosh. Uh, well, I practice, I have much less time to practice, so I have to be much better at practicing. Mm-hmm. So I'm much more conscious of how to make use of the time I have. I think I've, I've become much more effective in the in the little time I have to make sure that I'm really using it um, yeah, in the best best way possible. And and I think teaching helps you with that as well. Mm-hmm. Sort of when you're when you're working with students and you know, you're thinking of talking about how how would you practice this and um, ways to approach it that that helps with your own practice as well, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean I if I ever find the the golden formula, I'll let you know. But <laughs> yeah, I haven't found it please yet. Please do. <laughs> it's um, yeah, it's always juggling, um, doing the the basics enough and keeping it fresh enough, mm-hmm. and making sure that you don't try and practice for too long at one go, but making sure that there's enough time. I mean, if I, 
I mean, these days I don't very often have a whole day to practice. Um, but if I do, I find it quite a struggle. You know, we're talking about basically a completely free day when mm. I have no other commitments. I find it quite difficult to do more than about four or five hours. Right. And I know that as a student, I did have days when I regularly did six plus hours. And I sort of think, but how, how? could how could I have done <laughs> yeah. that? I mean, my brain just can't take in. Um, I think I, I think I used to practice. I, I think I just used to play a lot, mm-hmm. and I used to play for six plus hours. But I think now because I'm when I'm practicing, I'm practicing much more intensely. And so I'm absolutely exhausted after I've done, you know, 50 <laughs> minutes. Right. And I need, you know, a break. And, and, and I think to myself, oh, okay, I'll have a 20-minute break. And, and it ends up being half an hour, 40 minutes before I'm ready to go back mm-hmm. and do something more. Right. And, of course, there's an element of, of uh, if I've got a whole day to practice, then I'm, I, don't, I like the, the being able to take my time and sort of really waiting until I feel inspired to go back into the practice room rather than thinking, oh, I better get on with it because mm-hmm. I've got X, Y, and Z to do today. Which might make it more enjoyable yeah. too as well. Yeah. It's, you know, yeah. it's a process yeah. and not something that has to be done in a time frame. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, for myself too, I've noticed warm-ups have changed mm-hmm. over time. Um, you know, it used to be a lengthy process, really indulgent, and now mm-hmm. it's much more abbreviated for me. Is there a warm-up that you do that's kind of a staple, that's something that you need to do before a concert, a favorite, that's something you, make, you need to make sure that that you're um i do I, I i would say if they, if i had one favorite exercise it would be harmonics mm-hmm. um like uh from the low register and also from third octave notes letting the low notes uh, the sort of fake low notes come out um but i mean i i i love this sort of having to keep my mind focused on doing you know Tafnel Goba number four uh, scales and keeping really focused on 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 every single time I'm going up and every single time I'm going down, keeping the focus on on the sound and the evenness of the fingers and mm-hmm. the, you know whatever articulation I'm doing or and and it's almost more a um, concentration exercise than a flute exercise in right. a way. Um, I love doing breathing exercises without the flute, just to kind of wake my body up to to how. Flute breathing is different from day-to-day breathing, mm-hmm. as, it, as it were. Yeah, and you don't need the flute for that, which is great. Yeah, yeah. Is there what breathing exercise do you use? Um, I, I mean, it not terribly um, um, complex. Anything you know, <laughs> anything particularly exciting. But I mean, just sort of d- taking counted breaths sure. in, taking four beats to breathe in, four beats to breathe out, mm-hmm. three be- three beats to breathe in, four beats out. Or five beats out. Sometimes I'll change, um, and I'll increase the air going out. But just you know, um, doing counted, yeah, counted breathing. And I like the um, from Peter Lucas Graf from Check Up book. I mm-hmm. use his first exercise from that. But then I do it without the flute um, to give me really a, a focus. Much more. You can go much further when you when you're not actually having to produce a flute sound. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can do it on the road then too, right? <laughs> yes, although I don't. I do. I do. I do that really in the practice room. That's really part of my sort of focusing on. Okay, now is my time with my instrument, and so mm. it's it's almost a meditation, a sort of physical meditation, um, right? As as much as anything. Mm-hmm. Um, you started with William Bennett. I did, and yeah. also with Alain Marion. Mm-hmm. Um, did you take anything away specifically from each teacher in a way that? You think they might have influenced your sound or your way of playing? Oh, I think um, both Wib and Marion influenced my playing enormously. And I, I feel very lucky, privileged to have worked with them both. Very different players, very different personalities, very mm-hmm. different teaching styles. And of course, I I studied with uh, William Bennett for four years as a... Uh, well, initially as, a, as an undergraduate and then one year of postgraduate. Um, and then I followed that up with uh, almost a year of uh, studying with Alain Marion in Paris. And so I was at different uh, stage as well of my studies. But um, I think we, I was amazed at how we would sometimes spend an entire lesson, which could be, could easily have been an hour and a half on a couple of lines. And mm-hmm. the amount of detail he would go into 
and the shape of the front of the note, the shape of the middle of the note, the shape of the end of the note, how that note connects to the next note. You know, and we're talking about a passage of 16th, maybe. <laughs> right. Um, and uh, so, so a phenomenal detail, um, which I think is great, great discipline for, for working. And it's quite interesting because both essentially French school, but very different sort of yes. approach to French school. Right. So Wib was really the sort of Moise... Uh, the line of teaching and and uh, and Marion was much more the Rampal sort mm -hmm. of uh, school. If you how like. were you drawn to Marion? Did you pursue studying with him on your own, or was this through an institute or school? Um, I went to the Nice Summer Academy. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of years, I think I must have been. Was it the end of my first year or end of my second year undergraduate? And I knew that someday I had this kind of dream of going to Paris um, because it had been such an important center for flute playing and mm -hmm. flute making and for composers writing for the flute and the Paris Conservatoire test pieces. And so I had this kind of notion that I wanted to go and study in Paris and I knew that Marion taught in Paris. And so I, so that was why I signed up for the Nice Summer School. And I really loved the way he taught and his energy. And um, so actually I um, I approached him and asked if, if I could study with him. And he said, uh, sure, the, you know, the, the auditions from, for the Paris Conservatoire in September. And then I was offered a job in an opera orchestra, which worked from September to December each year, Glyndebourne Touring Opera. And I thought, oh, my goodness, well, then I can't go to Paris. And so I asked every musician I knew, I said, what would you do? This is a situation I've been offered this this job four months a year. Of course, I didn't know that it, I would end up doing it for four, four years. Mm -hmm. I didn't know at that time whether it was going to be, you know, a, a sort of more permanent thing or whether it was just a one one off. But it was it was four months of work straight out of college. So I was excited by that. But I was also excited about the idea of going to study in Paris. And right. so I asked everyone, what do you think I should do? And really, the answers came back absolutely 50-50. People who said, you know, you can only ever learn by doing the job. And other people mm -hmm. who said, study as long as you can, because, you know, um, you won't get time to practice right. later on. So I thought, oh, well, what do I want to do? Well, I want to do both, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I looked into the uh, the possibility of going to Paris in January instead of starting at the beginning of the school year in September. Um, and that, because I was um, going to study in Paris with the French government scholarships, I had to, um, then I had to go back to the French embassy in London and say, you know, this is the situation and, is it possible that I could study privately? And Marion agreed to teach me privately and um, and the French embassy agreed to fund me for private studies as a sort of an exception because I'd got a job. Um, so that was all very lucky. And then even luckier was that I found an apartment near the conservatoire completely by chance. Um, and so my first lessons were at Marion's house outside uh, Paris. And then he found out that I lived so close to the conservatory. I said, well, why don't you just come to the postgrad class and uh, mm. and I can teach you, you know, at the end of so you can listen to the others and then I, I'll teach oh, you at the end of the day. So so that was that was absolutely <laughs> perfect. Yeah. So I wasn't I wasn't officially enrolled in the school, but you were just like a student. Yeah. yeah. And what was it like? kind of being this a student and being a professional at that point. I mean, having a job and trying to juggle both of those at the same time. Oh, well, the, you know, I think it's, um, I still feel like a student in that right. I'm still learning. So right. I don't think it's ever, with our job, it's never, you know, my studying is finished. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm studying every day. I mean, not only practicing, but I'm learning every day from the people around me, from the conductors, soloists mm -hmm. that we have. Um, so... I don't really see that as being like a second contradiction. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, right. Um, speaking of your your colleagues, it seems like mm. you're a really tight knit group in your flute section, and yeah. you all are really yeah. supportive. And I've seen tons of videos of you playing together, which is really lovely. Um, mm. How do you think that influences your playing as a section in the orchestra? Well, we, I mean, we all get on very well. I think it's um, we are all very different personalities and and players and different playing styles. I think um, we all have a huge respect for one another. We like one another. 
um, we socialize, you know, outside work, like when we're on tour, we often end up, you know, um, having dinner together mm -hmm. or going to visit a museum together or something. Um, so I think it's a very, uh, it's, it's a very interesting environment because we are so different and we complement each other. I think the fact that we are all foreigners means that the orchestra um, is what connects us in a way maybe that goes a, a step further than, than uh, people who, who are Dutch and, you know, are in their capital city playing mm -hmm. in their, you know, most famous national orchestra or something. Um, we all came to Amsterdam to join the orchestra. <laughs> Bynan performs as a soloist alongside her colleagues of the Concertgebouw Chamber Orchestra in her recording of the Mozart Flute Concerto No. 1 in G Major. A staple of the flute repertoire, Ms. Bynan meets its stylistic and virtuosic challenges with grace and ease. She shared some of her tips on performing the Mozart with me. I do want to talk a little bit about Mozart with you because you also have a recording of the Concerto yeah. in G, and I think it just sounds so, um, so light and fresh and you know, thrilling and exuberant, which mm. sometimes is challenging, I think, for a lot of flute players to get those characteristics yeah. because we play it all the time for every audition. Yeah. Um, you practice it for your whole life. You, you start playing it when you're rather young and maybe not that nuanced as a player or that educated. Um, so I think you can kind of get some bad habits with Mozart. At least I've found that with myself and and my students. Um, how, do you, how do you perform it and practice it and keep it so fresh? God, well, I mean, it's just great music. Yeah. It's really, it's, and we're so lucky we have got, you know, we've got not just one Mozart concerto, we've actually got three Mozart mm -hmm. concertos. We've got four fantastic quartets. Um, I think um, it's, it's, you hit the nail on the head, you know, it's what we play for almost every audition. Um, it's a language that every orchestral musician understands, which is why it's, of course, ask for it every audition um do you think it's important when you're playing it in an audition to to show more of your understanding of of classical rhetoric and not in, put so much of your interpretation into it or and, and maybe a balance a perfect balance obviously of both you know you know what um i really touches me when we hear when we hear mozart in auditions is the, the the performances which sound like people are thrilled to be playing this music mm -hmm. and so often it sounds like you know people are thoroughly cheesed off has yeah. uh, played it you know x times in x different auditions mm -hmm. and have or haven't passed that's sort of irrelevant but it's oh god we've got to play mozart <laughs> again and and instead of yippee we right. can play mozart again <laughs> and i always you know i i always feel so lucky that we can play the Mozart, mm -hmm. so I don't, I don't really. Um, I, th I think I do. I encourage people to to play the quartets. I'm very surprised at how often I ask students. So, have you played the quartets? Um, it's a very similar style to the the um, to both concertos, really. Um, there, you know, a lot of pa passages in the in the violin concertos you can transcribe there's a wonderful Bernreiter edition of the clarinet concerto for flute you know maybe if if we practice other mozart pieces to get the style and to get the the language and the finesse to work on the finesse we would appreciate the the two solo concertos we do have when we right. come back to them um and i wish people didn't have such a hang up about performing Mozart. And, you know, I hear so many times, you know, oh, I'm never going to win an audition if I have to play Mozart because, you know, oh, I, I have a real problems with Mozart or, yeah, I'm really worried about the Mozart. And I sort of think it's a language. He was a person. And right. we just need to give ourselves a chance to get inside the, 
the language and you know when there's so much other Mozart we can practice and hone our skills with and then maybe we would come back to the concertos with a sort of freshness mm -hmm. that we need because you know when 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 you when you're hearing 50 times the same concerto um you know the one that you are going to let pass is the one which has got an exuberance and, and a sort of energy and a pleasure of performing which shines through i think yep is there anything that you are listening to that's not classical music right now like if you were to open up your phone what's the last thing that was in your your itunes playlist oh gosh well actually to be honest i don't listen to a lot of music um uh, recordings I go to lots and lots and lots of concerts. I mm -hmm. mean, I go to one or two concerts a week. Um, I think there is nothing which is quite as thrilling as a live concert and being at that experience, which, you know, maybe you're sharing with 50 other people or 150 or, you know, 2,000 other people. I would much rather be in, in the moment and, and to, in a way, a performance is much more, is much more, do I mean vulnerable or so it's it's so much uh, a one it's it's a moment in time not only for the musicians on the stage but it's a moment in time for me you know so how I listen is absolutely dependent on how my day's been and mm -hmm. whether I've rushed to get to the concert or whether I've uh, met with a friend to, to have dinner beforehand and then we go to a concert together or um you know, so it's uh, it's a total body experience. Not, yeah, yeah, and 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 it's it's an experience you can't you can't replicate. Right, and not an afterthought either. It's hard for me to do everyday tasks. I don't know how people can listen with their headphones in and well, I feel, I think do that's things. Also and part of, I think that's also part of it. Yeah. I don't I don't believe that music should ever be sort an of on in the background. Yeah, yeah. Um, the only time when I I, I I encourage that is is when people are preparing an audition right and I say you know make yourself what I in my day you, you would call a mixtape mm -hmm. you know make yourself a kind <laughs> right. of um, a playlist um, and you know have all the symphony the entire symphony because it's so important you know an, an orchestral audition is so weird it's so bizarre abstract nothing to do with the job but unfortunately we all have to jump through that hoop to mm -hmm. get to do what we want to do um if we want to be orchestral players i mean but right. um but it is is so bizarre you know to play a few bars horizontally of a symphony which might last yep. you know more than an hour and then to play one line of a score which might have 20 lines on it so it's it's such a weird thing and the only thing that you can hope to do to make sense of that is to have the the wider perspective of know the whole piece and how that little solo fits into the whole um, the complete picture if you like Ms. Bynan is also extremely passionate about teaching. When she noticed that her own studio was made up of less and less flutists from the Netherlands, she partnered with businesswoman and amateur flutist Suzanne Wolf to build the Netherlands Flute Academy. The academy provides lessons and masterclasses to young flutists from the community and also engages in outreach programs with refugees. Ms. Bynan speaks to the program's ability to give an understanding to two people who might not be able to speak to one another, but they can communicate through music. It is an important medium that we can use to help connect with people. Thank you to Emily Bynan for providing her recordings of the Mozart Concerto in G with the Concertgebouw Chamber Orchestra. This has been an episode of Flute Unscripted. This podcast is sponsored by the Flute Center of New York. Visit their website at flutesforsale.com for the largest selection of new and pre-owned instruments. Use this season's promo code LISTEN for a special deal of $50 off any purchase of $4.99 or more. 
You can follow the Flute Center on Instagram and like them on Facebook to stay up to date on the latest events and masterclasses. Special thanks to our owner, Phil Unger, the Flute Center team, and Stefan Huskoldson for our theme music. 